Hello there, I'm Rob Torsellini from Bigelow Brook Farm and today I'm going to give you a tour of our aquaponic greenhouse. These videos are brought to you by our Patreon contributors. Our top contributors are aquaponics.ai, growpockets.com, trueaquaponics.com, and glassbottleoutlet.com. Thanks for your support. Now over the years I've done videos putting this whole thing together, but I don't think I've ever done a video showing the entire setup. So today we're gonna go through all that from start to finish. This greenhouse is 26 by 148 feet and the frame itself was built in the mid 1980s and installed at a nursery and I purchased the frame a few years ago the nursery had gone defunct and then I installed uh, the solar wrap film and the film has been working out really nicely um, I liked it because I could work on it alone and I could install it just in one section at a time I did have one section that a bear tried to get into it and ripped it open, but for the most part, uh, the wrap has uh, withstood hail, wind damage, and whatnot, so it's been very good so far. Now the greenhouse runs north to south, and on the north side, I have these uh, intake louvers where all the air is used for cooling, and there are some evaporative cooler pads on the inside that I use for helping to cool down the air. There's no other venting uh, in this greenhouse, so it's all done uh, through these. The cooler works really well. Uh, they cool the air temperature down by about uh, 10 degrees from the exterior to the interior. And then um, the air is drawn through the entire greenhouse and sucked through with uh, two 48 inch fans hiding behind these louvers. When the system is running, we'll go through about 300 gallons, sometimes 400 gallons a day, uh, just to use this setup. So it does require a lot of water, but it does help tremendously with keeping the greenhouse cooler. For the aquaponic system, the starting point we'll use as the highest point of the system, and that's where the water comes into the fish tank. Now this water is coming in and then it goes down to three infusionator nozzles which are used to help aerate the water and to uh, keep it circulating in the tank. Uh, this is 1,350 gallons and then I have a second one here which I haven't started using yet just because I haven't built out the whole greenhouse. Keep a net on the fish tank, um, even the koi and the goldfish they tend to jump once in a while so you don't need to find any out on the ground so you always keep a net on there. And then during the summer, I usually keep this uh, fairly well covered uh, just to help keep the algae controlled down. Now the fish are on an automatic feeder here. And then uh, the waste system is used here with a radio flow settler and a mineralization tank. And I'm going to do a separate video that details those a lot more, but uh, just roughly those are um, here and used for the waste uh, filtration. So as the water swirls through this tank, any of the fish solids that are in here uh, settle down towards the bottom and work their way towards the center. So there's a pipe in the middle that then comes through and overflows um, into the radio flow settler. And that sucks up any of the solids that are uh, down along the bottom here. And then um, that's somewhat a restricted flow. So there's a second overflow, it's more of an emergency overflow on the far side. Um, that any extra water in here um, then flows out to the drain line. And that's sort of like a Cornell style uh, fish tank because the water along the top is usually a lot cleaner than anything down at the bottom. So if it does overflow, at least what overflows um, is fairly clean. The water that comes in from the fish tank overflows into this Radio flow settler, this is a stilling well that the water settles down and then it works its way back up to the outer edges and then overflows uh, back into the main uh, drain line, which is over here. And this does a really good job of uh, getting a lot of the uh, suspended solids out of the water. <coughs> Anything that settles down the bottom, usually once a day I will 
open up a valve and let the solids run into the uh, mineralization tank. And that just sits here and adds air into that to help break it down a little bit more. All of the water coming out of the radio flow settler and fish tank comes into one of two uh, media beds and these are filled with expanded shale. You can see the water level is a little high in here right now. Um, what happens is that the Swiss chard really fills in with uh, roots so the uh, water has a tough time getting through all of the bed. So I just have a little channel where it can work its way down there. Now these are filled with uh, red wiggler composting worms which are used to help uh, break down some of the solids that may uh, get into here and they uh, thrive uh, in these types of conditions. In the media beds I like to plant my long-term plants and that consists of the Swiss chard and a bunch of kale and then in the second bed it's filled with a rosemary, a bunch more kale and hiding over there is a very sad looking oregano but in the spring it does really well. It just does not like the heat of the greenhouse during the summer. The media beds have their own bell siphons in them here and those are used to flood and drain the beds and I also um, have an overflow in here just in case so if this became root bound or something like that and it wasn't functioning if the water did flood in this bed it would just overflow this instead of overflowing the sides and wasting the water so that's a nice safety to have in a system. Once the water leaves the media beds, it flows down into here and then enters into my deep water culture bed. I also have a small pump that's in here that I'm using to pump water up to my new uh, Dutch bucket systems. So that's just thrown in here and then eventually just drains right back into the same spot. So I'm using my deep water culture bed as a sump for the entire system too. So new this year, I have installed these 20 uh, beto buckets for growing tomatoes. Um, they're doing fairly well in here. The tomatoes are looking nice. Oops, that one just came right off of my hand. And then um, I take them and lift them up to a cable that's uh, suspended in the uh, roof of the greenhouse. So as the tomatoes grow, I take the suckers off which get too large and these are hanging on these tomahawk hooks so all it takes is just to take it turn it once and lower it down and then I can uh, just add a clip onto it to hold it in place this is the supervisor's station in the deep water culture bed I'm growing lettuce on this far end and I started off in the little gravel beds as seedlings, let those grow for a little while, and then plant them in these rafts that hold 140 plants and let them grow out a little bit. And this is about the size I let them grow up to, and then they get transferred into uh, these other rafts. Now these rafts, I have some that hold 25 and some that hold 18 plants. I like to grow the heirloom variety lettuce. Uh, this is called Chris Mint and this is some red romaine leaf. And the leaves don't get red red. Um, if these are growing outside they would be red. The UV really helps to redden them up. Um, it's also a fairly delicate lettuce. You can see I have a few that have started bolting. It's been really hot um, this summer in the greenhouse. Um, so this red leaf bolts uh, much quicker than the, uh, the green leaves do. Inside the deep water culture bed there's an array of infusionator nozzles that are used to aerate the water and to help stir it around so you can see the bubbles coming up uh, through these holes. And that works really well with uh, helping to keep the root rot down and from things settling down in the bed. And when it's time to harvest these just pull right out. They have a nice root structure on them. Take off the slightly dead stuff pull off the grow grip and then wrap the roots around make a root ball out of it so these are sold as a live plant like this with the roots on it it helps to keep them uh, fresher longer I made up this fancy little bagging stand several years ago I set the bag on there that holds it and then I can just take the lettuce plants 
We'll drop them right in, drop it out, and we now have a bag that we put out into the farm stand refrigerator, and during the week people will come and pick it up. Further down in a deep water culture bed, I have some more Swiss chard. It does okay in here, but it does much better in the uh, media beds. A um, little bit uh, lower dissolved oxygen level in here than what's in the media beds. However, the um, basil does extremely well in here. In fact, I need to uh, cut this back. It's starting to go to flower. Not a big deal though. And uh, this does very nicely in the system. In fact, it grows too well and I have to throw a lot of it away because I can't sell it fast enough. For my bed liner, I'm using Ultra Scrim, which is a uh, two layer material with a netting in the middle of it and that keeps it from tearing. And underneath it, it's just a steel frame that I've bent and it's essentially a bladder that's underneath this and that will hold out uh, just fine. I sort of let this cherry tomato get out of control. This is the main stem here that I have uh, tied up going up above. But all this down here heads way into the back. These are all from suckers. And I finally gave up trying to prune it back and just let it grow. And these are growing much nicer tomatoes than the main stem. So I've been getting a lot of tomatoes out of that other area. I just have to crawl into there to, to get everything. But it's a massive, massive a plant and that's just one cherry tomato plant. On the back side of the bed I have my strawberries and they basically sit here and gain more energy over the summer. During the spring they're up in the front and that's when we harvest before even the tomatoes are planted. So that works out well just moving them off onto the back side and then uh, they'll go dormant here over the winter and then um, we'll move them again back into the spring back onto the front. And by moving, it's just floating the raft from one side to the other. Now on this far end of the bed, I have about 20 some odd uh, tomato plants in here. Now this is an Amish paste, it's an heirloom variety. And I always get comments on the leaf curling, but that's just what they seem to do. I've grown these for years without any problems. We have plenty of tomatoes that are coming in on here. They look really nice. And it's funny because I'll get some leaf curling on these, but the cherry tomato leaves are always perfect. So I don't think I really have that much of a nutrient deficiency. It could be something, but when I get this many tomatoes on a plant, I'm just going to leave it alone. These tomatoes are on spools instead of the tomahawks. I sort of like using the spools a little bit better because you never have to disconnect them from the wire so you reduce the risk of dropping your plant the tomahawks you have to take them off completely and put them back on so these are a little more expensive but i think they're worth the the insurance of using them without dropping your plant it's hard to see it but underneath all these tomato plants there's another array of infusionator nozzles helping to aerate the water it works really well by doing that it helps to aerate and to circulate the water throughout the bed. Here's some celery growing in here. I don't do a lot of celery, but it's nice to have. Few people like it in the farm stand. Hiding in this mess are a whole bunch of white onions and they're all done. I just need to harvest them now. They do fairly well in deep water culture bed. You just have to keep an eye on them. The grasshoppers seem to really like eating the greens on them. But for the most part, the onions do fairly well. Last in my bed were my cucumber plants. I have one that's barely alive. There's a little cucumber growing on this one here. Uh, but for the most part, uh, they got wiped out in the heat wave that we had. Being on the hot side of the greenhouse, it can be 110, 120 degrees in here and they could just not keep up um, with the heat and their leaves would curl during the day and that one completely died and this one um, just it did not die it's not diseased or anything um, i have a little bit of magnesium deficiency showing up in the leaves um, but that's not what killed them it was definitely the heat that did these guys in at the end of the deep water culture bed the water drains out comes down through this line and then there's a small uh, dc pump here that's variable speed. So this entire setup is running at about 65 watts plus another 65 on the mineralization tank. So the primary system to aerate the fish tank 
and to circulate all this water is running at about 65 watts. Then after the pump, uh, during the winter, I do have a small electric heater used to heat the water. And I do shut down the system uh, during the winter and just heat the water enough to keep everything from freezing. So that's about it for this system. If you have any questions about any of this in here, feel free to leave a comment or question uh, below. And there's a ton of other videos on my channel about this setup as I've built it and made changes over the years. So if you uh, do have some questions, um, there may be an answer for that in one of those other videos. Thanks for watching.